Alright. Uh, my name is Sarah Brown. I am 17 years old. Nice to be here, Sarah. But well, we couldn't have a better day. Oh. Well, the reason my parents moved here, this was the first house that they actually owned. They were renting places beforehand. It was a small house. We, my parents, uh, we, we did not have money. We couldn't be buying the homes on the other side of the alley, so to speak. We were close to St. Clair with the streetcar line and Grand Avenue. And then also Linwood School was right up here, four or five doors away. And then our church, St. Luke's on Lexington and uh, Summit, and then Central High School. But I always thought too, as I moved from that home, I thought if we had not moved there, if we'd even moved across the alley, probably I wouldn't be playing tennis. Well, I think this whole, my whole life really goes back to the way I was brought up. The women were not working at that time, so my mother was a full-time homemaker. My mother really never came up here to watch us play tennis, never. In fact, the first time that my mother uh, saw me play tennis was when I think I was 16 and we went out uh, to the girls' nationals and, and that was fine because I always knew I, I could go home and we'd have clean clothes, we'd have three meals a day, uh, morning, noon and night. The main thing is that we had a good stable home and right from the beginning we knew what was right and wrong. Like I'd be playing tennis up here like around 5 o'clock or 4, 4 o'clock some of the fellows would come up and they'd see me sitting around and they hit balls. And even when we were playing, I knew I had to be home at 5.15. And if I wasn't, my dad, I don't know how fellows whistle through their teeth. I mean, I could hear, hear the whistle and I, I knew I was late and I, I just would come home. So we always had, we always ate together. And I think, you know, we, I, I just was brought up the right way. And, uh, you know, and as I was growing up and playing tennis and so on, first of all, you're representing yourself and your family. But then it came to you representing your school, your job, uh, the people of Minnesota, I represented my city, state, and country, and uh, I never gave it a thought because I, I knew what was right and wrong, and I took care of myself, and I didn't make, I don't think I made a fool of myself on or off the court. I know I didn't. <laughs> it was altogether different. Most of, back, now you have to remember this is the war, war years and everything during the World War, and parents just did not fall, a few parents brought their kids to the tournaments and that, but nowadays, I mean, everybody goes from grandparents all the way down, aunts, uncles, and so on. My dad played a little bit, but nothing to talk about or anything. And we just did it because this Louis Sukup allowed us to come in. That's how we got started. Kids do it because their parents are, quote, more or less forcing them to. And then you see when they get to be 14, 15 years old, when they get to be that age, sometimes they've had enough of it, and then the kids quit, and, and the parents are all upset, and so on and so forth. I mean, there's a fine line there. My favorite memory, I guess, is that I never was forced to do anything as far as playing, and so we had we had rules at home and everything, but we were happy, and there were kids up here that you could play with, and after uh, after we'd come and play up here, my sister and I, well, Louis Sukla would say, well, come on up after the course I line, and we'd hit balls. Well, my sister was a little bit older than I was, and that wouldn't last too long when you're playing with a sister, and, I was the little one, you know, and chasing balls. And, and then she'd like to go home and play with her dolls. Well, a lot of times the boys right out here in the alley, there's some boys that lived out here, and they had a basketball hoop, and I might go down, and pretty soon they would include me to, you know, just play with them. And, and then and after that, we'd go up to Linwood School Playground here and play softball. There might only be eight of us, but we'd make up some game. And so we we're just doing fun things, and there were kids in the, in the neighborhood, and so, it, we just had a good time. Nothing was forced that we had had to do this or that. And then we'd come up here to the tennis club. I would like, and my sister did a little bit too, like in the morning when, when Louis saw that we could, and the women that would come up here nine or 10 o'clock in the morning to play. And he, when he first told us we could come in and play and use the practice court, uh, then when I was about nine or 10, I suppose, they could see that my sister and I could play as well as the women, you know. And so then they would include, sometimes well, a woman wouldn't show up, so they'd have one of us substitute, but then pretty soon we could play as a team, my sister and I. And when I look back, I really learned a lot from those women, and sometimes I know they said, oh yeah, we remember playing with just a little kid and so on and so forth. But I don't think they realized how, how much that taught us as playing. I mean, I learned doubles, that's where I learned doubles. A lot of those women, they, don't, they didn't realize it. 
and I, and as I got older and I would run into a few, I would mention how much they helped and so on. I guess my biggest regret looking back is that now you wish that you could have just told them outright. Now when all of you kids or people are young, it's nice to tell your teachers or, but as you get older too and you look back, then you can also go back and they're our favorite teachers, they're favorite people and just let them know what, what they did for you. And at the time you don't know right now, but when you get 40, 50 years old, you, you'll know. So from 1948 to 52, you attended Central High School and then 52 to 56 was St. Catherine University, and neither schools offered girls interscholastic tennis, um, yet you went on to achieve at a world-class level. Do you think your story would be possible today? Probably not. When I went to Central, uh, I remember the tennis coach would like would have liked my sister and I to play on the boys' team, and he checked into it. it would, at, looking back at that time, as a young, young girls, it would have been fun, but now, at my age and looking back, it would not have been the right thing to do. And then when I went to uh, St. Catharines, well, there, there was no interscholastic sports all over the whole country. St. Catharines, I, I, like I said, I went to public schools all before and I had a wonderful education at Linwood and Central because the teachers weren't right out of college and you had to sort of work your way to get in. Excellent education. And I went to St. Kate's when my sister went there first. I think neither of us wanted to go to the university. It was so big and so on and so forth. And I had an excellent education there. It prepared me for my teaching career. I was well, well prepared. What were some first principles or philosophies that guided your professional work um, on behalf of school children? The main thing when I was a counselor, I had to look at people as individuals. Every, every student is different. And the other thing too, you have to know more or less where they're coming from and why sometimes their behavior is this or that. And I would try to instill in the kids that I was counseling that everybody has gifts or talents. I mean, so maybe I could beat everybody in tennis, but if you had a group of kids out in front of me, I'd say, how many of you can swim? They'd raise their hand. I wouldn't be raising my hand. That, you know, we all have talents, you just have to find them. And unfortunately, sometimes people never find them. And like I said, maybe if I had lived over a couple blocks, tennis would, would not have been my talent. It would have been there, but I would never have, have known that. And then too, uh, when I was teaching, you have to look at where kids are coming from, their home situation and, and their behavior and that. And I'm, I'm more or less a direct person when I, when I talk to students. I, I don't like to listen to a lot of, before they get to the real pr problem. Or I, I, sometimes when kids were girls, they were like oh, 15, 16 years old, and they'd be getting into fights or getting into a hassle with another girl. Well, back in second grade, well, I mean, you're a junior in high school now, move on. But you have to look at each individual and see where they're coming from. A lot of kids, as you well know, it looks okay on the outside, but when you get back to their homes, it's shambles. I like this question a lot. If you had a top five highlight reel of your life, what would be some of those most memorable moments? First of all, I'm always thankful for, for my home and the, where I grew up in the neighborhood and everything like, like that. I'm also grateful for all of the people who have helped me from teachers and friends and so on. And, uh, in 13, when the first time we were able to go to the girls' nationals at Philadelphia. Looking back, my first year there when I was 13 years old, and I don't even ask me why, but this Mary Hardwick hair who was with Will Wilson Sportings, and she was a women's champion in England. And she and her husband had come over right before the war. And for some reason, Mary took a liking to us and to me. And she would always, the very first time, there was a picture of me uh, that I brought along. She would hit balls with me and give me pointers, and don't even ask me why. I mean, I didn't stand out, I, I was quiet, you know, I, and, but we, that's how it all got started with her. And, they became my lifelong friends. They, they just took care of me and uh, I, I, they, all, all the time. And I went, when I went back to England in 1989, it wasn't to go back to Wimbledon, but they were getting up, up in years. And, and I stayed with them down at their home uh, for two, two weeks and Don Budge and his wife, Don Budge was the first uh, major, you know, the major term was Grand Slam. And it was interesting to listen to him and everything too. I wish I would have asked them right then and there, why did you take such an interest in me from Minnesota with nothing and you had all these other girls with a lot more potential, Cal? I don't know why. 
Then I was still in the juniors when I was at St. Kate's because I was a year ahead of myself in school. So I was able to go to the junior girls for my freshman and sophomore year. And then after, and I had to work during the summer so I could go to St. Kate's, even though the tuition was only $300 a year. <laughs> and you laugh at that, but it was expensive at that time for us. And I had to work. And then when I graduated from a, a college in 56 there, I didn't, I didn't play in the any uh, women's tournaments. But then in 57, the Northwest Tennis uh, uh, Association, they asked if I would, if they would sponsor me and pay my expenses to play in the women's tournaments. And I thought, well, wh why not? So I did, I went in 57 was the first year. And uh, that year I ended up being ranked number seventh in the United States in singles. And then in 58, that was my best year in tennis. Uh, that was the year that I got to the uh, semifinals of the U.S. singles. I, oh, the, in that year, 50, in 58, I was not seated. It was, tennis back then was a lot of politics and the Californians, and why I wasn't seated, I don't know, because I had a good year during that summer of 58 too. That's the year we beat Althea Gibson and Maria Bueno, and we were unseated. I had to play with Dar Darlene, or she had to play with me too, uh, is because uh, my doubles partner, Janet, had had a back injury and wasn't around. I was playing somebody different every week. And Darlene would normally be playing over at Wimbledon with, El with Althea Gibson. They had won the, the doubles, the uh, Wimbledon doubles the year before. And Darlene was ranked like two or three in the country and the world. But that year, Darlene was working at a camp out in Boston or near there because she had to pay for her tuition. And so we met and she said, who are you playing with? I said, I don't have anybody. And she didn't either. And that, so that's how we got going. And we, however, we were unseated. And so we had to beat all the top players. And then to beat Althea, who was number one in singles, and Maria Bueno, who was number two. And they were uh, winners and runner up in the singles and they had won the Wimbledon doubles. And uh, we started out rather poorly. Uh, we lost the first set and uh, I had lost my serve, and then we won the second set, and then it came down to the last set, and uh, we were holding serve and so on. I think I had lost mine, but then Bueno lost hers, and it came down, we were ahead 5-4, and I was serving. And uh, I remember that game, you know, there's only a few games in my whole life that I remember, different shots, and it was 15 love, I was serving, then it was 15 all, then it was 30-15, and then it was 30 all, and then it was 40-30, and I was serving. And everybody played net at that time. Is they, they don't do that now, but Darlene was at net and then and Buena was at net. And I served to I remember I served to Althea and I came into net and when you come into net you don't never want to get caught in nose man, you wanna get up here. And I, I got up there and I mean she hit hit the ball to me and I volleyed with my backhand and it was sort of in the center of the court and I think I think Althea thought that Dar, uh, Bueno was going to get it and she didn't and, and uh, Althea couldn't get to it and that was the end. At that time, we were the youngest, well now we'd probably be the old, the youngest ones ever to win the U.S. doubles title and I was going to be uh, 24 then and, and Darlene was just a few months younger. So when I, people always remember Wimbledon because that's, that's the name, you know, but as far as my tennis, 1958 was the best year. And then when I went to Wimbledon, uh, that was quite an experience. I was able to get off school, the principal there, a month early. There were no indoor courts, no nothing. So I couldn't practice at all. And I went to the French Championships, so that was on real s slow clay. It wasn't like regular clay here. But the thing about Wimbledon is, you were more, I was more nervous because you had to walk so far and then you had to turn around and curtsy, you had to do this or that. And then if the Royal Box, if they went out for tea at four o'clock, you had to stop. Rod Laver described Wimbledon in center court. He said, Wimbledon's the cathedral of tennis, but when Wimbledon center court was a high altar. It was very, very quiet. And uh, they had a special standing room only at, in center court. There was people sitting up above and then they had the standing room around and then the lower one. And people would be lined up the night before waiting to get into the standing room. But it was just nuts over there how the people uh, were so crazy about Wimbledon. But everything was quiet when the Duchess of Kent talked to you. It was all quiet. They rolled out the carpet and that. But, and then that night, they, uh, the final night, they had a big banquet downtown at some fancy hotel. People were lined up on the streets there and everything. It was, it was sort of crazy. You think, this for tennis? That Wimbledon 
party lasted, I don't know how long, and then Fred Perry, whose clothes I wore, he had a party after. And I crawled in about three o'clock and <laughs> or four o'clock, you know. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that, that was the highlights. And when I was playing tennis, there was a lot of tennis coverage in the St. Paul and Minneapolis paper because there was nothing else. And sometimes they'd recognize my name. And this one lady, I always say this old lady, and I'm old too, the same age probably. And then she said, uh, I said my name, said, oh, that's a famous name. She said, oh, I, 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 don't, I, I know that name, I know that name. And then she said, well, were you famous? <laughs> we're getting on the elevator. I said, well, I played tennis. She said, oh, now I know. <laughs> so those, those are the highlights. And I, I guess the other highlight, the best thing too, is that I've had a healthy life. Obviously, America is struggling through a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic right now. Meanwhile, we are seeing a long-postponed racial reckoning occurring over half a century on the heels of America's civil rights era. What gives you hope for the months and years ahead? What gives you pause? I first met Althea Gibson, as you probably know. She was the first African-American, first black person who was allowed to play in any tournaments. But anyway, in 1952, and I didn't know her, I did not know her then, that was the first year that she was allowed to play at the U.S. Championships at Westside Tennis Club. And believe it or not, she was not allowed to come into the clubhouse, change, she was just not allowed to do that. Now you can imagine that. I mean, and then she turned out, uh, at, she played there in 1952, she played Louise Bruff, who was the number one or two players, and they were playing in center court, and uh, or the grand, or whatever, the center court, and a terrible storm came and rain and some of the statues were knocked down and, and that. And the next day, usually if you have to play, continue your match, they put you back on the center court. Well, they didn't do that to her. They put her on another court and then eventually Louise Bruff uh, beat her. Okay, so the first time I met Althea was in 1957. And it was uh, mainly a, with Mrs. Whiteman because Mrs. Whiteman put up some of the players that were playing in the doubles and so on and so forth. And I had the privilege really of playing Althea a couple of times in singles and she of course she beat me both both times I think I got a few games each set and uh, Althea her behavior on and off the court was impeccable and when I look back and think here a world champion she was one and two number one in the whole world and number one in doubles a number of times and she was treated just horrible but she was a world champion and, and imagine they didn't let her in, and it wasn't because, and I found out it wasn't because she was she was black. All these fancy clubs, and we played at very, very fancy clubs out in the East, they all were ritzy clubs. They were afraid, not about her, but the, the black people would come to watch tennis. Well, they weren't interested in women's tennis or even men's tennis, maybe a few came. And that was their, their big ob objection, you know. And I, I was thinking that with all this Black Lives Matter and so on and so forth, why, why if we're at uh, the stadium now at, where they play the, the championships, they have a statue of Arthur Ashe, which is fine, and Billie Jean, Jean King, but it wasn't Arthur Ashe who, who broke the ice, it was Althea Gibson. And I remember when uh, Darlene and I beat Althea and Maria Bueno, we had to play on Saturday because Althea was a singer and she was gonna be on the Ed Sullivan Show. And Darlene had made arrangements for her to drive us down to New York and she had a bigger car and so she drove us down. Well, that wasn't so easy for her either. We're both there and we had just beaten her and so on and so forth. But uh, she was she was a, a great lady. And uh, the only reason she quit, I guess, well, in, after 50, 58 there is because she had run out of money and this doctor, Dennis, who was sort of supporting her, uh, they, she needed money to go on. She, you know, she, she didn't have anybody to support her. And then she took up golf. and. I mean, she was a good golfer, but when you're competing against professionals and that, and she lived sort of an impoverished life after that. And uh, I, I've just wondered through all this, why isn't somebody like that giving, given recognition? And she's never received that recognition. If it wasn't for her, uh, who knows what would happen? I'll tell you one little quick story too. That morning that we were supposed to play her and we came down to breakfast and Althea and I were having breakfast and she was pouring honey into her tea or whatever she was drinking. And I just said, I said, what's that for? And she said, you'll find out on the court. <laughs> okay, that was easy to do. Yeah.